In today's crazy world, we're constantly using things we don't need, doing things we don't like, and never really moving forward or getting the results we're hoping for in either ourselves or our animals. Are you ready for a change? Join me, Wendy Patrick, your host on Quantum Years, Finesium Health's podcast, and become empowered to take control of you and your animals' health and well-being. We're all quantumly connected, so whether you're around the corner or around the world, it doesn't matter, because we can help each other and all work together on our journeys. So come, join me and together we'll myth bust, share advice, knowledge, truths and suggestions to help you awaken, grow and continue your journey to a healthier, happier life. Hi folks, it's Wendy here welcoming you to another edition of Quantumly Yours podcast from Finesium Health. And um, I'm going to do part two actually to last week's episode, which we started off talking about worms and parasites and bugs and things. So uh, as you see that we went and labeled it as part one for me to come back and do here a part two, because I realized that I hadn't really got into anything at all to do with ticks on the first one. So we're going to go into those nasty little things in a second. But first, I'd like to thank you all so far for following me and um, subscribing, letting me be part of your journey and um, coming together with us all once a week and knowing that there's a little bit of a, a support group all going through their own little battles, their own little trials and just looking for answers and trying to get some help and advice. And that's just a little part of what I'm trying to do. If there's anything I can do to help someone in their journey uh, with their pets and themselves and have a happier, healthier life, then that's my work complete. And certainly you guys actually just coming along and liking, subscribing, sharing, doing all that fun stuff and getting the word out there about us is everything I could ever hope for. So thank you all. I ask you to continue and also get in touch with us. Um, keep bringing in some questions and we love it whenever you actually come along and, and sign up and ask for some advice and have some appointments with us as well. And you can do that directly on our site at finessiumhealth.com dot com you'll always find us there links will always be as well in the description after our podcast on whatever platform you're finding us on whether that's youtube bitshoot rumble um, or shared through any of our posts on facebook or instagram or gab or telegram or anywhere else that we may pop up as the time goes on and we get used to working with all of these different platforms so let's get right back into it. So this is part two, um, our bugs part two, and let's talk about ticks. So we all know about ticks as they have become incredibly um, important or they've been getting a lot of um, energy put towards them, if you like, in the last few years, especially with the not so much revelation, but the recognition of Lyme disease being an actual thing, as a lot of doctors even would refuse to admit it or acknowledge it or knew enough about it to actually be able to detect it and identify it because a lot of the standardized health blood work testing is only really testing for perhaps one strain of the bacteria co-infection that goes alongside Lyme itself. So ticks have been the ones that have always been pointed to and going, you're the bad ones. You're the ones that have all the nasty germs and you're the ones that are giving all the Lyme disease. But 
Newsflash, I'm afraid it's any bloodborne insect. Um, so any any insect, mosquito, flea, tick, um, lice, uh, spiders even for that matter, um, that will bite some um, or some will bite and actually draw blood. But um, anything that uses blood as a food source has the potential to transmit it from one host to another so yay that's really exciting what do we do wrap ourselves up in bubble wrap and plastic suits um no although i think some people are doing that but it's not really going to be the right answer and it's not something that we are all willing to do to live the rest of our lives and enjoy our summer or our outdoors activities um, because we're scared of a little bug bite. Um, certainly these things are there. They're not to be taken lightly, but at the same time, if you go out and worry about it, the worry is actually going to cause you more ill health perhaps than having a bug bite um, where you may have a small reaction or an itchy spot for a couple of days and that's it. Um, if you end up with something worse than that, there are no different treatments. There are no different ways to address that and deal with it and help you cope with it as well. And I'm one. So having had Lyme, um, very well aware of different things that it can actually present as. And indeed, I have quite a few clients as well that are going through their journey with their battle of it too and there are different co-infections that come alongside with it. So it's not just your Bartonella, Babesia, um, or, or Bordetella. You've also got different things that can come along with it. You've got Mycobacterium avium, um, even encephalitis, H. pylori, um, leptospirosis. You can have all sorts of different co-infections that can actually accompany Lyme. So don't think you're off the hook if you just get a negative blood test done. Um, I was in that box or in that category. I hate being in boxes. And um, then it was basically, well, you don't have it. So it can't be that. You're basically going mad. It's all in your head. And I know I'm mad, but I, I wanted to get my health back. I wanted to not feel this way forever and carry on um, living the way I was with an, an awful lot of pain, discomfort, no energy, brain fog. Uh, creepy crawly skin it felt like I always had an infestation of bugs crawling across my skin and uh, which was alleviated at the full moon obviously maybe not obviously but after watching last or listening to last week's podcast you'll be a little bit more um, knowledgeable about that as well and I wonder how your your schedules and your uh, journals are going so far for those of you who are taking the challenge so anyway um, detecting these little uh, insects and things like that, well, certainly, I mean, checking your dog, checking yourself after you've been in the woods or outdoors, um, it doesn't even have to be deep woods either, because ticks can actually be transmitted from mice to deer to wherever, and basically they can hang out on a blade of grass and wait until they smell the um, carbon dioxide off gassing from a mammalian body whether that's you, your dog, your cat, your goat, your horse, it doesn't matter. And they go, oh, there's food over there. So um, I get asked a, a bit about, um, well, what do you use, Wendy, for prevention? And quite honestly, absolutely nothing. Because no matter how well marketed and how well presented a lot of these products are, I have not found anything that will stop a tick from latching onto an animal. If it's hungry enough, it's going for a meal. Um, it's the same sort of thing. Sometimes if you're hungry enough, you'll grab some junk food rather than go and cook yourself up a nice supper. If you're that hungry, you'll eat pretty much anything. Um, the tick's the same position. And if there's a mosquito flying around, it's like, oh, there's a food, there's a, there's a meal right there in front of me. Or mm, there's one in the next yard. Well, I'm going to stop here. Um, so whether it's off gassing a little bit of neem oil or whether it's, um, stinking a little bit 
of this out of the other thing or garlic or whatever. Some people will use all sorts of different additives or natural supplements in their, their dog food um, or even on themselves to try and repel these nasty little bugs. But um, to be honest, I have not found anything that works yet. And, you know, I, I welcome anyone to challenge that. I'd love to be able to find something that really, truly does 100% work. Um, but I don't believe anything is 100%. But, um, you know, don't take my word for it. Go do your own homework, as I always try to encourage you to do. And I hope some of you do. Um, so, I mean, you can sort of deter some things for to some degree, but... You know, I'll also hear the anecdotal stories where, oh, my dog's worn an amber collar and never had a tick on him. But the question always is, is, well, if he didn't have an amber collar on him, would he still be free from ticks or would he be covered in them? And if you're going to the lengths of having an amber collar on them, I'm probably going to guess that a high percentage have also gone to cleaning up their diet. So if you have a healthy, vital animal, they're not going to be stinky enough to attract bugs and nasty little things. Um, because it's dirty coats, therefore clean coats do not attract fleas. Therefore, that's why I always advocate for a good grooming schedule and routine and keeping that hair clean, um, amongst other reasons. And, um, you know, non, non stinky animals that are healthy or anything else that don't have any issues going on on their skin, they're not going to be as attractive to that bug fly, flying by or uh, as they run past a, a blade of grass. But at the end of the day, I think we're stuck with ticks. And um, unless God in his infinite wisdom decides that they're nasty little evil things and should be eradicated from the planet, or we're just going to have to put up with them. So, Always be checking your animal over um, in the armpits, like underneath the legs, um, up around the groin area, around the tail, on the base of the tail. The ears are a good place under the ears, even the face, because if they've stuck their, their nose or muzzle down into something in the groin to sniff at or play with or anything else, it's very, very good place for a little bug to just latch on even under the eye um, or in the, the the beard or anything like that. So check them thoroughly, go through and see them. If you want to put gloves on, absolutely fine. Um, it's more for the fact that you're not going to get it bit latching onto you and transmitting something to you. I think is more the reason for wearing gloves to remove them because you're going to wash your hands after you've touched one of those little critters anyway. Let's be honest. Um, you're not going to go and stick your fingers in your mouth and, and lick your finger clean after you've just removed a tick off your dog. If you are, you've got more other issues. But anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, I, I am a little cynical, but you're, you might be getting used to me by now. Um, at the same time, we have to find some humor in this. Now, what I'm holding, if any of you are watching rather than listening, I'm holding a little set of tick keys or tick twisters, which I have to be very careful how I pronounce those words. Um, and they are just the little keys that you can find. Oh, I've got a really teeny tiny little tick. Well, I'll use a really teeny tiny little tick twister. And uh, you basically just a little, it's like a little mini fork. Uh, two-pronged fork and you basically slide that over the little beastie and then you twist it and pull gently doing both at the same time so twist and pull at the same time um, for anyone who says you shouldn't twist it um, basically I've removed a couple of hundred in my time um, maybe even more than that I used to keep a jar with quite a collection in it and specifically whenever you have one dog that you take nearly 50 off uh, it doesn't take long to rack them up there but if you're trying to just pull it straight out uh, it's not going to go well and nine times out of ten you're going to hear that little snap and you've left the mouth parts in anyway um, for the fear mongers out there that are going to say, well, that's the worst thing you could do and blah, 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 blah. Actually, it's going to scab over and fall off in about three or four days. So what I usually say, couple with your little tick twisters or tick keys. Do not use tweezers. I'll explain why in a second. But once you remove that tick, 
grab a bottle of our Phenosium colloidal silver, uh, recommended and approved by Health Canada as a veterinary health product. I don't know whether anybody is watching to see me trying to shove this into the camera or not. Uh, but there you go. Um, very, very popular because of its antibacterial attributes. Um, so it's going to keep that site clean. And also, if you have broken off the mouth parts and left it in, they're just sitting underneath the skin. Don't try and dig that out and, and cause even more aggravation to your animal. Leave it there. Spray it three or four times with that and walk away carry on then you get rid of your tick the reason you don't want to grab it with tweezers is because if that tick is engorged in other words it's got a big fat belly behind its mouth parts you've got a chance of compressing that and yes you can make it throw up into the animal i was laughed out of somewhere or other uh by ooh i want to say probably about eight or nine years ago, um, whenever I said, no, you don't want to use tweezers to squeeze it. You also do not want to use a burnt match to cover the end of it to make it draw itself back out. Because when it does that, it has to expel what's in its stomach or in its mouth in order to breathe because you've covered the anus, which is how it was breathing when it's buried um, shoulder deep if you like in your animal feeding so you cover that with vaseline you cover that with a burnt match or you do anything to cover that tick it's going to regurgitate its stomach contents into its host whether that's you your child or your animal now i got laughed out about that and a couple of years afterwards it was then proven that that is actually what happens but what do i know but that is why you don't want to use a lot of these old fashioned remedies of removing a tick. Oh, you cover it with this. You should never, ever, ever cover a tick with something because if it has got residual blood from another host and it's sitting on you and you do that, you are going to have a higher risk of getting whatever else it's carrying from that other host. Um, so you want to reduce your chances of contamination, if you like of being infected with whatever it may be carrying or have. So let's just err on the side of caution. Let's just be a little bit logical and common sense approach when it comes to this stuff. And you can look all this up as well. Um, what has been proven about them? What has now been shown? How the safe way to remove them? Yada, yada, yada. So I've still found to this day that the best, the easiest way is with one of these little tick keys, slide it in underneath the body, and give it a gentle twist as you are pulling it out. Um, if you hear that snap, just keep pulling and spray that area with colloidal silver and you're going to help to reduce any other bacteria at that site. And if you come back and check it in a couple of days, you will just find a wee scabby bit um, a wee knobbly bit underneath the scab as you take that off your animal and um, there'll be nothing left under there. Now, you've done the removal. Prevention, we find out, is pretty futile um, to the most part. Um, detection, we know how to find them. Disposal is the other thing. This is the fun part. <laughs> this is where my sick sense of humor or my uh, my twisted joy uh, <laughs> comes into play because the most highly rewarding part about removing a tick is to then kill it. And one of the best ways to do it is to set it on fire. <laughs> So no, don't be burning your house down doing this, but take it outside onto the ground, onto the asphalt or onto concrete. Um, it's not going to run off on you. Um, don't worry about that. But basically, if you have a, a barbecue lighter or cigarette lighter or whatever, as safely, obviously, no small children doing this, please let the adults do this. And then if they burn themselves, it's their own fault. <laughs> But it's it's very rewarding because whenever you do set fire to them, they blow up. And who doesn't like to blow something up? Listen, I, I lived in Belfast. It, it's going to be there. It's going to be there. So 
you can set fire to them. Flushing them is not recommended. Washing them down your drain is not recommended because they will actually crawl back up again. Um, I have this fear of flushing any insect that's living down my toilet because I have horrible fear of sitting on the loo and it coming back up and biting me on the bum. Um, but that's just a strange little hang up perhaps on my side. But burning them is great. So even if, you know, uh, you're having a campfire in the backyard or you have a fireplace in the house um, or even on top of the stove where you can't burn your house down and clean up after you. But yeah, it's quite enjoyable uh, in a in a sad, sick little way. But this little piece of evil has now been removed from your life and from your animal. And it's some sense of satisfaction that the game is now up and it cannot buy anything more. So certainly as well, um, I will just finish off with saying that if you do get a bite and if you do get a bullseye rash, um, then certainly go get it checked out as soon as you can. The thing is the bullseye rash may not show up until up to two weeks after you've had the bite, at which point you're already infected and um, a couple of rounds of antibiotics I'm afraid to tell you are actually not going to get rid of what you have uh, a lot of people say oh we had two weeks of antibiotics for this or we had a, a series of this or that or the other and um, well yes it got rid of the symptoms but you will find the next time that your immune system is compromised or you have a major surgery for example um, that will reduce your immune system to the point where anything that's lurking around or sleeping may just jump back to life again and go, oh, we're going on a rampage. And all of those symptoms will all come flooding back. So the only way to really, really deal with it is to identify your um, bacterial strain or the bacterial co-infection and um, get some help with both aspects of that. So we can certainly help you. We can certainly point you in the right direction as well as lots of different um, natural methods out there um, because there's honestly nothing else that's actually dealing with this because unfortunately the medical, um, uh, blah, sorry, the, the medical industry at this point has certainly not come up with a tried, a true and tested um, answer because they don't actually know enough about it itself. Um, they still haven't um, acknowledged the fact that there can be up to 42 different bacterial co-infections that will go along with this little disease. So um, yes, the natural world does know things and uh, we are aware of different things just through the different research and stuff that we actually do and get into things a lot deeper and a lot more holistically and by testing the body and presenting it with things and asking questions rather than just science or lab results. But anywho, I digress. There's a surprise. But um, yeah, the and as well as that, the, the bullseye rash only shows up in a very, very small percentage of cases too. So um, a lot of times you won't even know there is anything and a lot of times you won't even show any um, ill effects or any symptoms at all until it may be a, a point in your life where you've gone through a very serious stress um, issue or in my case it actually never presented until after I had had major surgery and um, it could have actually been with me for quite some time in fact I could have been born with it so even though I'd had a few ticks on me and things like that, there's no way of knowing where it ever came from. But uh, it it came, it it conquered uh, for a point. And I'm going to say now that I have conquered that little beast. So uh, hopefully you'll join me again next time. Uh, hopefully I haven't grossed you out so much. But I will tell you that the next episode next week is going to be highly enlightening. And I can't put it any other way because I have the wonderful um, Kay Aubrey Chemin joining me from Photonic Light Therapy Institute. And she's going to talk about light, which goes hand in hand with us with all of our quantum testing 
and energy work that we do because light and energy and frequency and vibration is all one big parcel um, um, of the same thing. So that's going to be hugely, hugely entertaining. And I'm very, very excited and can't wait to have her on. So hopefully you'll join me next week. Again, thank you. If you've stayed this long, you are a trooper. You are a superstar. You absolutely rock. And I can't wait to see you next week on your journey. And hopefully you'll let me know in the meantime as well how it's going with your two month challenge with your journals to see what your symptoms are like to see if you have parasites. So anywho, uh, I think we're done talking about bugs now for a while. I want to go on to happier, more joyful things and more interesting things. So we will do that. But thanks again, folks. All the best to you um like share subscribe tell all your friends book an appointment finessiumhealth.com and uh, we will see you next week so this is me and dimitri climbing up the side of me here saying good night for now and stay possum bye All information, products, and topics discussed in the show are simply the host and guest's personal opinions and are for informational purposes only. None claim to offer a diagnosis, treatment, or cure. All listeners and viewers are encouraged to do their own research and consult with their own healthcare providers before changing or adapting any new protocols. Finesium Holistic Health, nor any of its entities, assume any responsibility or liability for any consequence relating directly or indirectly from the information contained within the podcast.